Today we're going to talk about how we grow spiritually. And I'm going to give three answers to the question of how does somebody even grow in their faith? I was sitting with a business leader of a rather large organization and I was picking his brain about some leadership principles, specifically about hiring practices. Because I figured in a company as large as his, he's probably learned a few things that might be relevant to us here at church. And so I was asking him, I said, tell me about your process. Tell me about how you do things where you work. Now, just to get a sense of who this guy is, he is a Christian guy. He is very affable, easy to talk to, friendly, kind, charming. He's the type of guy that, frankly, I would love to grow up to be like someday. And so I was really interested and a little bit surprised by the answer that he gave. So first he described their hiring process, which of course has things like background checks and different layers of interviews and all of those things. And all of that made quite a bit of sense to me. But I asked him, I said, okay, tell me about like how you know for sure. Like, do you just assume that whatever recommendation is made, that person is the best person for the job. He said, well, there's actually one more part of the process that's a little bit different, that if I'm hiring somebody who's fairly high level, meaning I might work closely with them, he said, my wife and I will take the person who's interviewing and their significant other out to dinner and we'll go to like a nice restaurant or something. And he said, I won't even talk to them about the job specifically, but what I'll do is I'll watch how they interact with their spouse. I'll watch how they interact with the server. I'll watch how they just sort of handle themselves at the table, and then I'll be able to tell something about whether or not this person will be a good fit. And I said, okay, like, really? Like, have there been times where somebody has done well in interviews, passed all the background checks, and still something happened at dinner where you said no? And he said, oh, absolutely. He said, there was this one time where we had this person who had just killed it at all the interviews. You know, they were incredibly gifted. They had sparkling references and recommendations. They did great. And everybody was saying, hire this guy. But we went out to dinner with him and his wife. And he said throughout the course of the dinner, this guy repeatedly would eat with his mouth open and then talk with his mouth full. And he said, I immediately knew, nope, this guy does not have the cultural awareness or the table manners to be part of my organization. Now, I was a little bit taken aback by that, that this guy would have lost a job over something that small. And so I sort of pressed him for a few more details. And he said, you know what? You can put a lot of a kind of a show into interviews, but when you get to that point where you're not thinking about things as much anymore, you start to notice a person's habits. And you start to notice a little bit about how keyed in and how grown up in some senses they are. Now, that might seem a little bit strange to you, but I want to take you to another table. Now, this man who I was talking to is also a grandfather. And I, my guess is that when he's having dinner, I didn't ask him this question, but when he's having dinner with the grandkids, if little Tommy or Susie knocks their food on the floor or, or talks with their mouth full or something, my guess is he's not going, well, sorry, kid, you don't have what it takes to be in this family. My guess is that his expectations of a child are very, very different than his expectations of somebody who's supposed to be a grown-up because a child needs to learn certain habits over time as they mature. Acceptable behavior in a toddler is not acceptable in an adult. We expect people to grow up, to develop practices, manners, habits, if you will, as they get older. We are in week two of our Habits of Grace sermon series where we are examining, among other things, where we've really placed our hope and we're looking at these little tiny things in our lives that can make a huge difference. We mentioned last week that Duke University uh, published a paper that said that 40% of our daily lives are made up of these little habits, these things that we might not even be thinking about very clearly, but take up a big chunk of our time. And so if you were listening last week, you may have noticed that we talked a lot more about the grace part than the habits part, and that was by design. We wanted to say right from the very beginning that who you are at your center, your identity, where you have placed your ultimate trust and value, that matters more than anything else. And frankly, it drives everything else. Your identity will shape your behaviors, your habits, 
and how everything works its way out from there. Well, today, we want to talk a little bit more about this growing up and these, these habits. We said last week that one of the anchor habits, if you will, of the Christian life is gathering together in person at church. And we talked about this online service and we said, hey, it's great for some things, but it's not great for developing habits around getting together with people physically in a building and just how important that that is. Well, today what I want to talk about is, well, how do we grow spiritually outside of a church gathering or outside of a message like this? Like Monday through Saturday, not just the Sunday stuff. Like how does someone grow then? What sort of habits should they really have? Now, I know when I say that, that we're not all necessarily at the exact same place spiritually, but I want to give us a thought experiment. Just pretend that you're a little ways along in your faith journey. And again, maybe you're not even started, but let's just pretend. And somebody comes to you who just became a Christian. Like they just had that moment of going, oh my goodness, my old life was a dead end. My, my old behavior was sinful. I, I need to like turn from that. I, I, I'm going to trust this Jesus who died for me on the cross and raised again to life. And I'm going to put my whole faith in him. So imagine that a person comes to you and they have sort of that brand new understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. And when they come to you, imagine that they say, hey, uh, here's the deal. You Christians have a bunch of weird phrases for, for kind of this new life in Christ, like being made new or being born again. Well, I kind of feel like I've been born again, but now I feel like I need to learn how to walk, right? Like, like sure, like I'm a baby in the faith, so what can I do? And you say, well, attend church. And they say, well, yeah, yeah, of course. And you say, never miss church because the worship pastor there is the best in the world, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, everybody loves them, right? But, but they say, okay, do it. And you say, yeah, I get that, but sometimes church feels really far away from the classroom on Monday. And, and, and the fitness center on Tuesday and the job site on Wednesday and the doctor's office on Thursday and the party on Friday and the game on Saturday. You know, sometimes Monday through Saturday, it's really hard for me to know how to grow. So how would you answer them? Are there certain habits or certain things that you say, do this if you want to grow spiritually? Well, I'm glad that you're listening today because I absolutely love this message about how we grow. It was probably seven, eight, ten, I don't remember, years ago that I was listening to a sermon by Tim Keller. And when he taught on this text, it like, it just something clicked for me. And so that, that message has seeped into many, many messages since. So let's turn to Galatians 5 and see three ways that we grow in our faith. Now, the context here uh, of Galatians 5 is this is... The Apostle Paul, who started this kind of church in this area, he was writing a letter to a church which is in what we would call modern-day Turkey or Galatia at that time. And he had shared the news with them that Jesus had come into this world to live a perfect life and to die a sinner's death, like a spotless sacrifice, to take on the punishment that should be due us so that we might take on the righteousness that is due to Jesus. And that's the message that he gave. And so you had a number of people who were relatively young, youngish, in their faith. And when he told them that, they believed and they were excited, but they didn't really know how to walk or how to grow in their faith. And so some people came to this church and they said, oh, you want to grow in your faith? You want to grow spiritually? And they said, yeah. And they said, well, then you need to be like more Jewish. And they said, like, what do you mean? Well, you have to circumcise your kids on the eighth day. You have to keep a kosher diet. You have to practice the Sabbath. You have to do all of these things in accordance with Old Testament law. And some of them said, really? Like, that's how you're supposed to grow? I said, yep, that's, that's the way you can know that you are earning and growing in righteousness and holiness. And so some people kind of believed that and started to get pulled in that direction. And other people were thinking, I don't think that's how this works. And so what we see in Galatians is Paul's frustrated and hurt response to them trying to get them back on track so that they could understand the truth of how we grow in our faith. So with that, let's read Galatians 5, starting in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, 
The works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Now, Paul contrasts these two different paths of life. And he says there's like the path that's driven by the flesh and, and, and all the works of the flesh, they're phaneros, they're, they're evident, they're apparent, everybody can see them. It doesn't need a lot of explanations what some of these things are. He says, so everybody can see what that is. But there's another kind of life, which is the life of the spirit, which is not mastered by appetites and impulses and sinful things, but is mastered instead by the Holy Spirit. And so he says, you need to walk in these things, this fruit of the Spirit. That's kind of weird. He says, fruit of the Spirit, like singular, but then he lists a whole bunch of things. Like, you can't just take one of these by themselves. They all have to go together. And he says, walk in the Spirit. Now, if the question that we've asked is a, is a good one, which is, well, how do we grow spiritually? And someone says, walk by the Spirit or walk in the Spirit. It's kind of like, Okay, like that's, I mean, that sounds good, but I'm kind of asking how, you know, like, like I'm not exactly sure what hacks or practices or habits I should have. Like, tell me what those are rather than talking about uh, the fruit, right? Like, and so, you know, while we may have wanted him to give us a self-help manual, he doesn't. He talks about this fruit, but, but in so doing, there's something incredibly brilliant that he does where he connects this whole thing to the bigger story. Now, I'm about to get a little nerdy on you, but at the very beginning of the Bible, God creates the entire universe, including these two people that he places in a garden where there's all of these trees that have fruit that they're able to eat. And as long as they walk with the Spirit of God, they will eat the right kinds of things. But as you might know that story, they choose to do the exact wrong thing. Instead, indulging their, their flesh, their, their sin, and it sends us into a whole bad way. Well, what Paul says is, no, no, you're supposed to walk like they were supposed to walk. You're supposed to have the type of fruit that they were being offered. Sure, sure, I mean that in the food sense, but also metaphorically, we're supposed to have all these good blessings that have been offered to us by God. And by using this analogy of fruit, it connects us to that big story, but it also tells us something about how we grow spiritually. And I said I would answer that question in three different ways. So, so here we go. Here's the first. We grow inevitably, inevitably. Growth is sort of, well, it's kind of mysterious, especially if you think about like plant growth, right? Like a plant sort of just grows because there's power in the seed. A seed gets placed in the ground with the right amount of dirt and the right amount of water and the right amount of sun and temperature and all these things. And then it just sort of happens. Like the power is in the seed itself. It's not sitting there coming up with strategies for how it's gonna grow. It just sort of happens because this power is in it. I mean, we've all seen a plant that's like bursting through a crack in the concrete or like roots which are heaving concrete. Like there's, if you were to ask, well, what's more powerful, concrete or a seed? You'd say, well, concrete, a rock or an acorn? You'd say, well, a rock, except when the power in that thing starts to grow, which it inevitably does, and it actually proves itself to be more powerful. Now notice what Paul says. He says, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And this brings us to a Bible nerd moment of the day. Bible nerd moment of the day. And it's this. There are a number of phrases here where Paul says something like walk by, be led by, keep in step with. He has all these sort of different phrases. But I want you to notice something about this first phrase. Because when we read it, walk by, it sort of puts the action on us. Oh, this is a thing I'm supposed to do. But if we were to translate this literally, including the, the order of these words, what it would actually say is, by the Spirit, 
y'all walk. And the desires of the flesh, no, y'all should not gratify. So by the Spirit. In some ways, what he's saying is the power of God and the Spirit is bigger than a seed. And if you genuinely have come to understand who this Jesus is and have asked and turned to him in forgiveness, well, then that is the Holy Spirit who has powerfully done that work in you. And when he has done that work in you, he is going to grow something in you and empower you. And he is going to lead you and shape you and convict you and enlighten you. In some senses, spiritual growth, if you've genuinely become a child of God, is inevitable. It is going to happen by the power of the Spirit. Even the phrase led by the Spirit in verse 18 says, I mean, hey, you're led by the Spirit, right? The, the verb there, and this is John Stott, who is a famous pastor, scholar, author. He died about 10 years ago. But, but he said this, the verb is used of a farmer herding cattle, of a shepherd leading sheep, of soldiers escorting a prisoner to court or prison, of the wind driving a ship. There's a metaphorical use to it, but he goes a little bit further. He says, as our leader, the Holy Spirit takes the initiative. He asserts his desires against those of the flesh and forms within us holy and heavenly desires. He puts this gentle pressure upon us and we must yield to his direction and control. How do I grow spiritually? Well, in some ways, inevitably, if you've genuinely come to a place of placing your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit is going to grow in you, your, your, your faith. It's just going to happen. Now, most mornings, I don't eat breakfast. I know, it's the most important meal of the day. No, it's not. That is just marketing ploy by Big Cereal. But, you know, some people are really into breakfast, whatever. I'm more of a water and black coffee kind of guy. So let's say that I come down into my kitchen and my children are there and they're eating cereal or eggs or whatever. If I see that, and even to some degree smell it, I don't know if I smell cereal, but I, I don't care. Like, it doesn't make me want to eat. Nothing changes about me to, to want to grab some food. It's just not my routine. I do something else. But if I walk downstairs and into my kitchen and I smell bacon, or I smell that heavenly sweet donut smell, well, then I don't have to consciously think about growing hungry. All of a sudden, I just, my stomach starts to growl, and I'm hungry, and I find myself, now I'm now I'm eating breakfast. Now, maybe this is a bad illustration because donuts and bacon sound more like the works of the flesh than the works of the Spirit. But, but, in some ways, this is how the Holy Spirit works. He stirs us and he grows a hunger in us for Jesus. There's just something, as, as we're just living our lives, he produces this desire to move and to change and to be shaped and to be captured by who Jesus is, period. Inevitably, you grow spiritually if you have genuinely come to faith in Christ. How do you grow? By the Spirit's power, inevitably. But there's more. That's only the first way that we grow spiritually. The second how we grow is we grow gradually. We grow gradually. Now, look at this list that Paul gives us here. These are some incredible fruit that ought to be displayed in our lives. So, Agape, which is love, which is self-sacrificial love. Uh, kara, which is joy, deeply rooted satisfaction and delight in God. Irene, which is peace, which is a rest in God's wisdom and plan more than in our own. Uh, makrothumia, which is forbearance, or in other words, putting up with other people. Uh, Christotes, which is kindness, which is showing others mercy. Agathuson, agathusone, which is goodness, which is internal consistency and transparency. Apistis, which is faithfulness or reliability and loyalty. Prautes, which is gentleness, which is self-forgetfulness. And egkratia, which is self-control or choosing the important over the urgent. All of these things, which we look at that list and go, yeah, I mean, I need to be exhibiting those kind of things. All of those things are grown inevitably, through the power of the Holy Spirit, but also gradually. Those things take time. Real progress in our life takes time. Fruit grows over time. You cannot see it. You can do your best and stare at an apple tree and, and just for hours and try to notice it growing, but you're not going to see it. There will even be certain seasons, like the wintertime in Michigan, where it appears that it's totally dead, where it's just like not producing fruit, there's no leaves, nothing's happening. 
And yet there's still some processes going on inside that fruit tree which are going to prepare it to grow again. And if you were to go during the growing season and it's warm and all of these things are happening, if you stare at it, you won't see it. But if you walk away for a couple months and then you come back, you go, oh my goodness, this has changed so much. But you only see it happening over time. We love those stories of God changing lives in dramatic big fashions. And some of us have had those moments where God grew us up a whole bunch in a very short amount of time. You know, we, we heard just the perfect sermon or went to a youth retreat or a mission strip or, or whatever. And all of a sudden it's just like, yes, I feel like I took a huge jump forward in my faith. But also some of us have experienced times where it feels like nothing is happening, where we are in a, a winter season of sorts. Some of you are in that season right now. You want answers from God that frankly, you just haven't been getting. You've looked to God's people and some of them are flaking out. That desire to just experience some holy peace in your life is completely lacking. And some of you are thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I'm not growing. And you have to recognize that spiritual growth takes time. Have you read the Psalms? I mean, many of them are a person going, oh, where are you, God? I don't feel like anything's happening. And yet, God was doing a mighty work on, in, and through them. For you, if you're in one of those seasons, listen, it might be winter in your spirit. So maybe you need someone else to just say, in Christ, you are, in fact, growing in your faith. I mean, the mere fact that you're listening to this right now suggests that Jesus is doing a work in you. I mean, think about the 12-year-old who cannot wait to grow up. But every day when they look at themselves in the mirror, they think, oh, I'm not getting any older, I'm not or any taller rather, I, like nothing's really changing. And then when they get a, an occasional blemish, like acne or something to show up, that's all they can see. And they don't see the fact that they're actually growing. And then grandma shows up after not seeing them for a couple months and they walk up and she hugs them and she says, oh my goodness, look how you've grown. I can't even believe it. Believe it because that's how growth works. Sometimes you cannot see it up close in the mirror, but over time, dramatically good, big, powerful changes can take place. So just let me give you two nudges before we move to our point three. These are just two quick nudges. The first is this. If it's true that spiritual growth takes time and it's gradual, then we must be patient with ourselves, and with our loved ones. Assuming that we're, we're doing the right kinds of things, we'll talk about that in a moment, but assuming that's the case, and it's just not feeling like it, be patient with yourself. Be patient with your three-year-old. They're not 13 or 33 or 63 yet. Just, there is just, it takes time for some of this to happen. So that's the first nudge, is just be patient. The second nudge is this. Our, our church is a relatively young church age-wise for the like average person. So this is an encouragement specific, specifically to those of you that are like 50 and above, right? That's not old. It's just if you happen to be 50 and above, if that's you, I want you to know that we need you, like grandma in that story, to speak truth to our younger people, to, to speak that you're seeing growth in them because we have many students, young couples, families here that might be in such a grind of life that they cannot see their way out of the next fever for their little kid or the next stuffy nose. They cannot imagine a day when they would have enough money to be able to like retire or go to a restaurant for dinner. Like they're just in that season. And so one of the powerful things that you can do if you are in more of that season past those younger ages is to look at somebody and say, oh my goodness, look, at, look how you've grown. That is such a powerful thing when somebody ahead of us in life comes and speaks that over us because growth is gradual. So how do we grow spiritually? Well, inevitably and gradually. But you may be thinking, wait a second, I thought this sermon series was called Habits of Grace. And so far he's telling me these nice principles, but nothing that's like tangible for my growth from Monday through Saturday. Well, I beg to differ, but that's okay, because number three, growth, how we grow, is also 
intentionally, intentionally. It is ultimately the work of the Holy Spirit to grow us over time. However, that doesn't mean that we just sit back and do nothing. If you look at the life of Jesus, we regularly see him pulling back and retreating, so to speak, into a quiet place where he can pray, where he can meditate, where he can think on God's word. We regularly see him doing those sorts of things. And even here, if you look at this text, you'll notice that while Paul said, be led by the Spirit, by the Spirit we walk, kind of thing, towards the end of this text, in verse 25, he says this, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, this is a different kind of walk verb than what we saw before. Before, it was sort of a, just like a general living where the Spirit is empowering it. But here, the word is more about walking a certain line, like keeping on the path that is set before you. This gets used in some different places, but it's like you need to fall in line. You need to craft habits and practices that put you in step with the Holy Spirit. Well then, what could we do? What is something beyond church attendance on a Sunday that we could do to develop a habit from the Monday through Saturday part that would really keep us in step with the Spirit? And the habit for the day is engage God's Word daily. George Mueller, 1800s pastor, educator, director of an orphanage said, the vigor of our spiritual life will be an exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and thoughts. The vigor, let me say that again, the vigor of our spiritual life will be an exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and our thoughts. We must daily engage God's Word. Now, if you are someone who has been a Jesus follower for a while, to listen to a number of sermons, my guess is you've heard that before. Somewhere along the way, you've been encouraged to read your Bible, pray every day, and some of you have absolutely made that a habit. And my guess is, if we were to talk to you about it, you'd say it's been the most important habit that I've ever developed in my life, to daily pause and get in God's Word. My guess is some of you are tracking with that. My guess is also that some of us definitely are not, that although we know that it is in fact the best right sort of daily habit that we should have, that for whatever reason we have tried it maybe, we've failed, and now we feel guilty about it, and uh, it's become this whole big, big struggle for us to actually daily engage God's Word. So, for just a few moments, I want to give us some very practical, I hope, tips on how to begin this new habit. Now, there's a handy little book written by one of my seminary profs called Eight Habits for Growth. The professor's name, the author's name is Daryl Dash which sounds absolutely like a superhero's name, but nevertheless, uh, he writes this book and he gives some very sort of doable, small steps that we can take to start crafting our habits to become more and more like Christ. So here's just a few things that I'm sort of stealing some of his stuff and adding my own to help us engage God's word daily. The first thing is this, make a sensible plan. Make a sensible plan. Like, are you going to listen to God's word daily or are you going to read it? Are you going to listen on certain days and read it on other days? Those are both viable options, but make a plan. And is there a better time of day for you to focus? Like if you're a total mess after lunch and kind of like out of it and tired, don't make that your time to do this. But, but think about your day and when you have the most focus and energy. Think about what place, where will be your place? What place in your house, your apartment, uh, in your bedroom will you sit when you engage God's word? And then think about how much you want to try to read as part of your plan. If you look at this little chart here, if you want to read the entire Old Testament in a mere 40 days, it will take an hour and 39 minutes, which might seem pretty daunting. In fact, if you have no habit of daily Bible reading, that seems incredibly daunting. But if you want to read it over the course of two years, you can read the entire Old Testament in only five minutes a day. Only five minutes a day. So think through, what is a plan that makes sense for you in your life right now to daily engage God's Word? Now, every so often, I need to like redo this and make a new plan. And just recently, 
I've started making a little bit of a new plan. Our church has created this website called Habits of Grace. And there is a Bible reading plan on that webpage that reads through the entire Bible in, I think it's two years. And this reading plan comes from the Common Book of Prayer. Also on that webpage, not only is there a reading plan, but there are some different prayers that can be read to kind of prompt your own prayers. And so my habits or my new plan has been to read along with the Habits of Grace uh, webpage that we have. And it's the first thing in the morning, it's to wake up, let the dog out, and then go in my basement and sit on the floor, stretch a little bit, you know, get my leg out there, make sure it still works, you know. And then to open up my Bible to this Habits of Grace page to look at it and say, okay, where exactly am I supposed to be reading today? And then it's to allow my eyes and my mind to focus the very first thing in the day on God's Word rather than a social media influencer or news items or my schedule for the day or sports or whatever. Before I let my mind go to anything else and turn on a TV and start surfing my phone, I want my first eyes and mind of the day to see God's word. And so that's been part of my new plan. So make a sensible plan for you. And if this webpage, Habits of Grace, helps, awesome, do it. I know Brantley is using that. Ryan's using that. I'm using that. And hopefully others of us will use that and we'll keep refining it and make it very, very helpful for us. But make a plan. Make a plan. Second thing, just show up. Go to the place and be there with the word of God. Know that there will be some days where you're going to read the Word of God and you're going to run into like a long list of names. It's going to be like, whoa, no fun. Or it's going to be something that's kind of mysterious or strange or you're like, man, I'm not sure. The context here is really strange. I'm not sure I get That's okay. Just show up. It's like going to the gym on a day when you don't have much energy, but you're like, I might as well go anyway. And you might not do the full workout plan, but listen, a workout is better than no workout. So just show up with God's Word. Make a sensible plan and then show up. Third, map out your tomorrow. So you got this plan, you're gonna do it, you're just gonna show up, you're gonna do it, and then at night, when you're brushing your teeth or whatever, as you think about your next day, map out, wait, am I, do I, is there anything that's gonna get in the way of me doing this thing at the same time tomorrow in the same place? Just give a little forethought to what the next day will look like. So, so do those three things, and then the last thing is this. When you miss, notice I say when, don't quit. When you miss, don't quit. Here, here's, what, here's what happens to me when I get on some of these reading plans. I will go, okay, I'm going to read the whole Bible in a year, or I'm going to do this thing with the Bible project, or whatever. And then what happens is I miss a day. So then the next day I'm like, oh, I've got to read two days worth because I can't get off track. And then I miss like four days. <laughs> And then I miss like a week when I'm on vacation or whatever. I miss a bunch, right? And then I come back, I'm like, oh no, I've, now I gotta read like 10 hours just to catch up with the reading plan. Stop that, that's a waste of time. Who cares if the reading plan doesn't finish at midnight on New Year's Eve and I'm still reading some sections of Revelation in February of the following year, who cares? Just when you miss, don't quit, just keep showing up. It's not like you could go to the gym right now and make up for seven years of inactivity in one day. Just show up and do it. And when you miss, don't quit. For the fruit of the Spirit to grow in our lives, we must regularly, daily make a habit of engaging the Word of God. It is like eating, where if we don't do this, we should notice it and feel like we're in a, almost a weakened state. This habit, perhaps more than any other, will be a basis for how the Holy Spirit grows us. It's the primary word, or primary way, rather, that the Holy Spirit weeds some of the stuff in our life and then waters the new growth that he has. There's other ways he can do that, but this is the primary way. Outside of attending church on a Sunday, this would be the habit that's like, yes, you, we have to do this if we want to grow intentionally. Not just not, 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 not just gradually, right? Not just inevitably, but if we want to also grow intentionally. For years, um, all the kids uh, in Jamaica, uh, and I've been there a number of times working with CCCD there, uh, but for years in Jamaica, there was this move that all the kids would do where they would go like this. They'd, they'd kind of put their arms like this, 
and, and in case you're not sure what that is, and that's certainly not a very good version of it, uh, that was kind of the victory celebration of uh, Usain Bolt, who was one of the greatest sprinters to ever live. He's a Jamaican man. And uh, for a number of years, he was known as the fastest man on earth. Now, I have driven past uh, the, the area where Usain Bolt grew up and the very first track or training grounds, like his, his uh, school, primary school, uh, where he went to school growing up. And as you look at it, there's truly nothing remarkable about that setting uh, other than the fact that that's where Usain Bolt grew up. But I want you to imagine for a moment an eight-year-old Usain Bolt, uh, may, maybe not even wearing shoes, just outside playing with his friends, and they decide that they're going to race each other. Now, when, when you were to look at an eight-year-old Usain Bolt running with his friends, my guess is you would not be able to predict gold medals and world records and all that kind of stuff just by looking at him. But I would guess that even as an eight-year-old, if you looked at him, you go, huh, there's something there. Like his his, his build, you know, like, like uh, kind of his stride, his, his joy in running, his explosion off the line. My guess is you would see that there were some gifts that he had that he didn't produce, you know, just part of his makeup, the way God gifted him in his genetics. You would see, oh man, there's something there. But, but even still, it would still take a long time for him to move from just this person who inevitably was going to grow and get faster to being a better sprinter. And it would take tons of intention, a lot of work and practice to grow up to be this gold medalist and this icon of sports. How do you grow? Well, in the same way he did in some ways, inevitably, in some senses, the Holy Spirit's the one doing the work. He's planted the seed of the gospel in us. Gradually, it's going to take time. And, well, intentionally, it also takes work. So let's dive into these habits of grace this week. Well, in just a moment, we are going to continue on in worship uh, through song. You know, we would just really encourage you um, to, whether it's through this song or not, to find some time uh, in your week to just enjoy and, and take delight in who Jesus is. It's so important for us um, to just simply take delight in, in who he is. So um, we'll do that in a second. But before we before we go into that, we just have a few announcements for you. We do. Our regular three-service format will return on Sunday, January 20th. 22nd. And those service times are 9.30 a.m., 11 a.m., and 5 p.m. Also, there are so many things going on at GBC right now, and we simply cannot list them all. So the details on everything happening can be found in The Loop, which is our e-newsletter. And it's the best way to stay up to date. You can subscribe at graceatu.org slash loop. And then finally, here at Grace Bible Church, we believe that giving is an act of worship. You may give online at graceatu.org slash give or by mailing your offering to our 1300 South Maple Road address. Let me pray for us as we continue in worship. Jesus, we, uh, we thank you for your word. Um, we, we know that you have promised us that your word does not return void. And so, um, God, I, I, I pray that, um, that it impacts us um, deeply um, and that we are able to live it out. Um, God, let us worship you in, in spirit and truth uh, now in these moments together. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh 
for me and I'll glide this open sea like the stars your word will align my voyage and remind me Captain, my soul trusted.